Okay, we are going to start. Hello, everybody take your places. Uh, welcome back to the third session of this long day. It's on. Uh, there will be two uh, presentations in this session. Emily Apter from NYU will go first and speak on equilibrity, followed by Adi Ophir from Brown University, who will speak on the political. Great. Thank you, everyone. Um, so, thank you to Jay for giving a paper on equilibrity. <laughs> uh, now I don't really have to do that very much, but um, I just will begin with a little pedantic note that the, a little closer, that the, um, the uses of equilibrity go through Etienne's writings. There's an initial usage which I won't be discussing in much detail here, which is from this, what was a 1991 lecture, uh, what, um, and which appeared later in Masses, Classes, Ideas, published in 1994, where the two central questions are, what is the politics of the rights of man and what are the limits of democracy? And these things will enter into my discussion, but I won't be sort of taking them on. I'll be working a little bit more with the book that came out as La Proposition de l'Egal Liberté, which appeared in French in 2010 and in English in 2014, with the less thetic title, Equal Liberty, Political Essay. So as you can see, the proposition was taken out of the English title. Um, the English edition is blurbed by Bruce Robbins um, irresistibly. <laughs> and I just have to indulge. Balibar works his way through the house of left-wing political thought, performing a sort of philosophical spring cleaning. He disarticulates complex concepts only to reassemble them in better, more usable combinations. It's a call to action. Robbins draws attention to how a political concept works cognitively and genetically as a recombinatory medium, a grammatology in plural idioms that mutates and replicates. Capable of powering the agency in actio, it eschews ready instrumentalization, and as we've already heard this morning, it is incompleting and deconstructive. I've always been fascinated by Balibar, the thinker in and of untranslatabilities, so let's look more closely at this untranslatable concept, Egal Liberté. It's first and foremost, as has already been noted, a portmanteau word, a word that, in doing double duty, wears a heavy coat, does plenty of heavy lifting, binding the cont contents of two concepts, equality and liberty, in a supercharged one fur uh, that's also kind of Gordian knot. Each discrete half of the equality-liberty dyad must give up some measure of its autonomy and singular meaning, but it gains something when the two <coughs> becomes a one, which is to say sublated. Now one could say that most key words, if not all polysyllabics, are of this portmanteau kind. A recent conference at Columbia, which I didn't even get to, but um, <laughs> it was devoted to critology, Drew, drew this out in its brief, uh, highlighting the dynamic and often neglected second half of democracy, kratos, rule of government, within the duplex demos kratos. Equiliberty similarly activates the component parts. At once compressive and compositing, the term splices egalitas and libertas, while at the same time holding their antipodal logics in non-relational suspension, as in the antinomy. And you can hear this in certain phrases that are used. Equilibrity means that politics is founded on the recognition that neither freedom nor equality can exist without the other. The suppression or limitation of one necessarily leads to the suppression or limitation of the other. Um, yeah. So uh, this antinomy also we can see is both related to and sometimes operates as aporia, much in the way of Balibar's aporia of ultra-objective and ultra-subjective political violence, which was projected from the standpoint 
of unrepresentability in his book, Violence and Civility. And just to give you a little flavor of this, I won't read the whole quote, but he says, in trying to suggest a way of visualizing the fact without explaining it, that these forms flow continuously into one another, remaining in contradictory fashion utterly different, like the two sides of a Mobius strip as seen from a local standpoint, and indiscernible, hence identical from a structural standpoint, like one and the same point on a Mobius strip when it is considered in global fashion. Obviously, this is a way, still Balibar, of imposing on the imagination in order to represent the unrepresentable, the moment when, impossibly, the subjective and objective coincide. Like these duplexes of violence and civility or citizen subject, equilibrity performs as a term for the blind coexistence of points on a topological schemata, with equality and liberty together defining an aporia, or a kind of ar obstructed Archimedean point, through their absolute mutual indifference and structural identity. Equilibrity performs other kinds of interesting rhetorical labor as well. We've already heard about the tropology and the, the force of the trope in, in Balibar's thought, and I'll just say a bit more about that. And one could speculate that it is precisely in its function as a trope of tropes that it becomes a meta figure for thinking how thought thinks or philosophy philosophizes. It's catacritic insofar as it crosses categorical boundaries with words because there otherwise would be no suitable word. It's both hyperbole, a pleonastic excess, where equality doubles a quantum of liberty and liberty does the same, and it, an elision or a syndeton, insofar as it edits and economizes American and French revolutionary prescriptions, life in the pursuit of happiness in the case of the Declaration of Independence, and fraternity in the French Republican trilogy, Liberté, Égalité, Fraternité. Now, the force fields of these withheld terms continue to exert pressure on Egad Liberté, which serves then not just as a marker of appositing, but also of a reductio ad quem of enlightened Republican doxa. What happens to this alighted material, the cast offs of fraternity life and the pursuit of happiness? To pose such a question is to conjecture a reading of equilibrity in the broader context of what it conceptually retreats, that is, in relation to the concept of fraternity as interrogated, say, in Derrida's Politics of Friendship, or the concept of life in vitalist accounts of subjective imminence found in Deleuze, or Derrida's meditations on François Jacob's La Logique du Vivant. It might lead as well to a reading of the pursuit of happiness in Badiou's recent philosophic recuperations of political willing in the La Leçon du Bonheur, the lesson of happiness and in praise of mathematics. In both treatises, mathematics is set up as a perseverant path to the true life. And this life is conceived as theatrical embodiment, as experiment in the formation of a subject who overcomes this conservative self's life-conserving instinct for risklessness and the bounded existence of finitude. Badiou suggests, quote, that happiness is fundamentally egalitarian because it integrates the question of the other, whereas satisfaction, tied to the egoism of survival, ignores equality. It is a restricted figure of subjectivity, a figure of success as measured by worldly norms. When the Stoic says, be satisfied with being satisfied, she or he participates in this, a, a, a syndical vision of social life circumscribed by the normative claim, la revendication. By contrast, and I'm still paraphrasing Badiou here, happiness poses another order of demand in line with Lacan's do not give up on your desire. And this translates in Badiou's language as do not give in to living the way of the society of calculation. For Badiou, happiness opens up the larger project of defining unalienated number. And he will propose several theses as a, rem a remedy, foremost among them a quest for, quote, the numbers related to the infinite, or rather to the fabulous world of different sorts of infinity. To remedy the dictatorship of number, he maintains, 
one must find a double infinity, that of true science, which establishes the rational, not religious or economic framework of a thinking of numbers, and he means rational numbers, not rationalism here, and that of poetry, which sings a pure quality, nuance, difference, forever exempted from any law of the market. So we see here that for Badiou, infinite number prompts the desire for a truth that is true in the sense of what he calls a non-revealed truth of the mathematical proof and of a truth whose force is only poetic. So one of the things, of course, that's very interesting here in Badiou's thought, and I'm going to try to bring it into some relationship to Balibarian questions, um, is the the way in, is this kind of question of a literal and tropological, um, in, a, in a sense, questions of true, justice, uh, the just and, and justesse, um, the and n number both in terms of um, the infinite. Where are these concepts being veering off, especially in, when they are carried over into economics and politics? And where are they, in a sense, uh, profoundly referential in a kind of mathematical, noumenal uh, mode of thinking. Uh, and so this is, in a sense, I think one of the, uh, the questions that's raised even by a concept like equilibrity. Um, so though he may have excluded uh, happiness from the equilibrity equation, something having to do with number, with equality, inalienable numbers, mixed ratios of positive right to negative liberty, and the infinite, is also at work in the concept of equilibrity, or at least I'll make that claim. When Balibar seeks to institute the trans individual, we've already had an allusion to that, by soldiering it to, quote, an institution of the political in which neither the individual nor the community, neither freedom nor liberty can exist without its opposite, he has recourse to an aporia constituted by an infinite process of intellectual and practical invention. It's a kind of good infinity of praxis, if you will. And arguably, like Badiou and Ranciere, his approach to the problem of equality retrieves and reactivates the old French form of the word equalité, now put back into play with the modern French égalité, to underscore the force of the Latin equalitatum, nominative equalitas, referring to number, evenness, smoothness, universality. By the 15th century, égalité applied to the state of being equal starts its course towards a political theory of citizenship with reference, especially in English, to privileges and rights, to the fact of being equal or having the same value, to parity, to equal treatment of people irrespective of social and cultural difference. Balibar takes stock of the Roman formulas equa libertas and equam ius that Cicero used, quote, to indicate the essence of the regime he called res publica. But his focus is on the emergence of a proposition derived from the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen, the well-known phrase, men are born and remain free and equal in rights. Where liberty and, uh, where equality and liberty were, and this is Balibar again, perceived as two faces of a single constituent power. He associates this power with the moment of revolution that inaugurates political modernity, making equal right the concept of a new universality, the unity of man and citizen, from which from then on would appear as correlative despite restrictions on distribution of rights and powers. The element of conflict from this unity of opposites, he continues, allows us to understand why claims for increased powers for people or emancipation that result in new rights take a revolutionary form. It is this increased powers for people or emancipation that result in new rights take a, rev um, I'm sorry, um, it is this combination of conflict and institution that I, Balibar, call the trace of equilibrity. Well, liberty is then a problem of the differand, the insurrectional trace produced by the unity of opposites, and a problem of the mathematics of rightness. What is the right increase in power of the people 
capable of producing the creation of new rights. What is the increase that? It is also a problem of the count, a matter of determining how the universal citizen subject will be counted. As Balibar notes, it assumes what Rancière calls the part of those who have no part, which confers a universal signification on the demand of those who had been kept outside the common good or the general will to be counted. Finally, equilibrity operates according to negational logics. And these are very interesting, often close to what Badiou calls reasoning by the absurd, with reference to a Parmenidean style of argument found in one of Cantor's set theorems. This is Badiou here. It won't be shown directly that it's impossible for there to be as many subsets as elements. Instead, it will be shown that it is impossible for that to be possible. For Badiou, this enables a remarkable philosophical event to occur, the discovery of an impossible consequence. He says, you reach the true by making the impossible emerge from the false. While succumbing neither to the temptations of scholastic exercise, nor to the seductions of mathematical magic tricks, Balibar, one could say, experiments like Hegel and Marx with, this kind, with a kind of reasoning by the absurd, through negation, sometimes through subtractive logics of loss and forfeited gain, as in the phrase, equality's isolated execution would end up in a form of suppression, while freedom's sole implementation would result in a corroded superiority or dependence. And it really takes a minute to get your head around these things. And sometimes in the form of the negative proof on the order of an Elenchic Aristotelian refutation of two negations, as in, if it is absolutely true, that equality is practically identical to liberty, it means that, that they are necessarily always contradicted together. Equality and freedom are contradicted in exactly the same conditions in the same situation because there's no example of conditions that suppress or repress freedom that do not suppress or limit, that is, do not abolish equality and vice versa. We were talking about these reversals of reversals, this kind of vertigo that we experience reading some of Balibar's sentences. But the question is, what's going on in this kind of reasoning? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to take that, the actual rhythm of these reversals uh, on board um, as politically and not just as sort of cognitive constructions. Balibar will also repeat a zero-sum version of this argument later in the chapter when he says the negation of freedom de facto destroys equality, and the negation of equality de facto destroys freedom. This is precisely why it is impossible to choose one against the other. The feature of impossible choice, another formal aporia, harks back to the mutually exclusive propositions of natural and civil liberty in Enlightenment discourse. In his study of the architecture of concepts in the 18th century, and specifically the emergence of the language of human rights, Peter de Bola attends to the parsing of Thomas Paine's right of, Rights of Man. De Bola cites Sir Brooke Boothby's critique of Paine in 1792. Um, he says that, and this is Boothby, when liberty is declared in one place to be a natural, imprescriptible right of man, uh, those thoughts of man, those rights of man for pain being liberty, property, security, and resistance to oppression, or in the words of Citizen Randall, unal unalienable to any other power, and in another, that is in another place, to be a power limited by law, two different sorts of liberty must be meaned. That's sick, he says, mean. For Debola, this formulation points up the fact that liberty cannot get one to equality because the concept operates with an isogetic modality comparing civil and natural kinds. What is needed then is a noetic concept operating with an axiomatic modality. In this case, liberty would be self-evident, he says, and declined in the continuous present. Then the same would go for equality. For Debola, squaring the circle of rights and man, with man conceived following pain as both individual rights bearer 
and collective placeholder for an aspiration, requires a different kind of grammar in which a term can be both substantive and noun, qualifying and adjective. Far from being an absurdity, Dipola contends, Paine's concept of man embraces both the singular universal, upholds individuals as rights, claimants, and the gener generality of mankind at the same time. In constructing a different noetic concept of rights of man, in which natural and civil rights are synonymous, where freedom is inalienable and legally prescribed, pain, according to Dabola, gives to the campaign for constitutional reform its most potent weapon and represents its most distinctive contribution to a history of the formation of human rights. And then he says, too bad then that it was so quickly dropped. Now, if I've dwelt here on Dabola's exercise in the political philology of the rights of man, focusing on the episode where a different noetic concept emerges only to be quickly dropped, it's because I think it relevant to the historical charge of equal liberty, forged as it is in the crucible of epochal efforts to invent, if not resolve, the antinomies internal to formal and material conceptions of freedom and equality. From the vantage of historical politics and a kind of uh, perhaps an enlightenment to come, Balibar's lexical work traces a through line between insurrectional aporias, the vanished and completed project of equal liberty in Paine's concept of the rights of man and in the declaration rights of man and, and of the citizen, and the, uh, and the declaration's rights of man and of the citizen, thus resurfaces in future sequences Foremost among them for Balibar, Marx's notion of Wirklichkeit, a project of working class self emancipation in which Balibar says the subjective moment, the negation, the differential element of practice is sublated in the use of citizen and citizenship to designate the type of equality and fraternity that prevailed among the revolutionary militants. End of quote. I initially chose equilibrity for the Balibar edition of political concepts because it was a linchpin for a project on translational injustice and translational inequality. The move, methodologically, was to bring notions of justice and equality drawn from, the political, from political philosophy to bear on linguistic semiotic notions of equivalence in translational practices. Important then was equal liberty's potential for problematizing the aesthetics of formal equivalence and disegno, rightness, justesse, just proportion, at the heart of political economies of, of equality, thus opening up alternative ways of imagining a praxis of justicing or making equal. As we've seen, Balibar, when adumbrating his neologism, Ega Liberté, had recourse to antinomies of citizenship grounded in moments of a dialectic that includes both historical movements and relations of force, which traced a differential of insurrection and constitution lodged at the heart of the relations between citizenship and democracy, and which took aim at neoliberalism's unlimited promotion of individualism and utilitarianism in response to the crisis of the national social state. Um, I had uh, recourse in, in, in some ways following this structure to antinomies of translation, residing in the polar yet relational forces of nothing is translatable and nothing is untranslatable, and the conjuncture in disciplinary terms of post-colonial theory and juridical critiques of sovereignty and force of law. In focusing on the politics of inequality and injustice within translation practice itself, I, I was thinking that instead of relying exclusively on equivalence, or more precisely the general equivalent, as a standard of linguistic and literary comparison, we should shift to notions of political equality and inequality with emphasis on constructs of the non-equivalent, the non-translated and the incommensurate. Equivalence, um, how am I for time? I, um, I don't have much more. 25 minutes in, so. A few more, okay, that's fine. Um, equivalence is acknowledged to be a vexed term in translation studies, but it's at least recognized as a preeminent one. Equality does not really figure 
But if one wants to insist on it now, it's to override the way in which equivalence neutralizes the politics of translation. Emphasizing translational inequality underscores class relations in concept history, grammar, and literary usage, and helps to identify situations of translational injustice. And these can include real-world instances in which language and accent tests are deployed as regulatory instruments on border crossers and asylum petitioners and become determinants of a right to be in language. Here we think of Derrida's derelictions of the right to justice, where he interrogates the abrogated right to be in the being without papers, être sans papier. This right to be, this being in rightness, or right with the law, or in rectitude, may be linked not only to statutes governing the right way of speaking according to vehicular norms, but also to determinations of aesthetic justice based on this justice of measure and proportion or beat, or the trueness of line and proportion in geometry. Since the Greeks, a geometric conception of equality underwrites justice. Prevailing is that which upholds both the, both the cosmos and the nomos. As this celebrated passage from Plato's Gorgias, uh, Gorgias 505 brings out, yes, wise men claim that community and friendship, orderliness, self-control, and justice hold together heaven and earth, gods and men, and that is why they call this universe a world order, cosmos, my friend, and not a disorder, uh, akosmia, or lack of control, akolasia. I believe that you don't pay attention to these facts, even though you are a wise man in these matters. You fail to notice that proportionate equality has great power among both gods and men, and you suppose that you ought to practice getting the greater share. That's because you neglect geometry. Here, proportionate equality, a principle of absolute, uh, or absolute of equality, guaranteeing the just share, assigns geometry political value as the techne that keeps the cosmic order in place by disqualifying a numerical or arithmetic economy that allows disproportionate shares to be accumulated. But of course, it has been objected that proportionate equality, insofar as it guarantees the hierarchies of the orders and produces exclusion, is itself the engine of inequality. So in a sense, the questions that emerges here is what would be a proportionate, in the sense of right or just, but non-exclusive equality? Uh, and here, this is in parallel with Balibar's kind of constant quest for a non-exclusive universalism uh, or exceptional logic of unexceptional politics. Such questions are impossible to answer, but they form a pendant to Rancière's queries when he writes in La Maison Tante of the quandary that arises when the principle of equality is, quote, transformed by the distribution of community shares. He asks, when is there and when is there not an equality in things between who and who else? What are these things and who are these whose? How does equality come to consist of equality and inequality? The debates around proportionate equality, infinite number, and trueness have no ostensible bearing on the specific uses of égale liberté in Balibar's lexicon, but they may become relevant to its future adumbrations. Equilibrity engages perforce a thinking of infinity outside the dictatorship of number, <coughs> the market, in its aporetic, heteronymic form of emancipatory politics and challenges and challenge to distributive models of equality and justice. A proper analysis of e equilibrity might situate it in the trajectory of Balibar's extended engagement with questions of political equality qua social citizenship, located outside the normative zero-sum logic of liberal or libertarian theory, which consistently weighs the value of equality qua distributive justice against the infringement of individual liberties. For Balibar, Equilibrity's real debate is precisely not with distributive justice, but with its own stakes as the historical trace of an emancipatory idea in the history of modern citizenship. 
And as we've seen, he says, identify this trace as a differential of, of insurrection and constitution. So in this context, equal liberty becomes a carrier of, this inter of the internal contradiction of social citizenship in the framework of the welfare state and as a response to neoliberalism's relentless promotion of individualism and utilitarianism, specifically Lockean models of proprietary personhood and possessive individualism. Equal liberty is then a manifest symptom of competing theories of the subject, the non-quant Rousseauian citizen subject, subject to his or her own law and living in a sense, and living in a sense for free by becoming a member of a sovereign community of equal citizens. And on the other side, the Lockean liberal agent who defines his or her equality of right by virtue, as Balibar puts it, of an equivalent capacity to engage in commerce in the sense of this, general sense of this term. Subject or agent. This choice inscribes competing models of equality and social citizenship on the antinomies of equal liberty. For Balibar, and this is obviously rife with political immediacy, equal liberty becomes a particularly motivated concept at the moment when it seems most vulnerable to, um, when it seems most vulnerable to when the category of citizenship with its power of transformation and capacity to historically reinvent itself suddenly seems to be shattered. This is a passage from the beginning of uh, the book and, and where he's reacting to Wendy Brown's notion of de-democratization, which as he puts it, takes stock of the mortal threats posed by liberalism and particularly neoliberalism to the classical Republican idea of active citizenship, threats induced largely by the, quote, decomposition of the traditional structures of domination and resistance and associated by Brown with Foucault's generalized and diffuse micropolitics of governmentality and with biopolitics. Balibar modifies Brown's de-democratization with his own notion of a-democratic politics in which, quote, the values inherent in rights claims collected under the name equal liberty no longer play any role in their operation and development, even as forces of resistance or contestation. In these terms, Trumpism, might, one might venture, is a hybrid of anti-democracy, autocracy, dictatorship, fascism, and a democracy, the abrogation of the right to, the right to citizenship, the right to vote, the right to a living wage, the right to language, equality set free, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the right to language. Um, and so on. Equal liberty then becomes newly relevant in this context as a remobilization of the right to, uh, and let's come back to this idea of a right to politics. Le droit à, in its capacity, not only as a structuring condition of Balibarian as well as Derridian critical protocol, or as a figural projection of the messianic emancipatory aporia, but also as a key word for rethinking democracy outside the regime of what Ranciere termed the arithmetic of exchange. Here we would take the term equal liberty also beyond in some ways its Balibarian usage to designate an antinomy of social, social citizenship that produces positive charge from dialectical contradiction, that's basically his use, um, and treat it instead as a placeholder for the indeterminate value of the positive property of freedom in the demos, as a name for the perplex of proportionate equality identified neither with vul vulgar arithmetic nor ideal geometry, and as a denomination of freedom from the dictatorship of number, which is to say from existential economies measured by debt, portfolios of risk, pre pre predictions of risk, poll numbers, and politically indifferent applications of the universal or general equivalent. Thank you. So I have some quotes, so I have handouts and uh, screen. Uh, 
Just one each. My presentation is, is but a prelude to an essay on the political. Uh, it was supposed to be written as a close dialogue with the Balibar, but it was written in the, in the dark shadow of the recent elections. And uh, a recent theme about which I didn't intend to speak today has become irresistible after the election. As a result, the constructive part of my presentation will be sketchy and fragmentary, but I hope uh, the direction I, I'm taking would still be clear enough to allow for uh, conversation and debate. I still, uh, I'm still with equal liberty, and I start from the, uh, a passage that I found just in the middle of the book, uh, at the center, uh, and here it is. There will be a permanent tension between the conditions that historically determine the construction of institutions that conform to the proposition of equal liberty and the excessive hyperbolic universality of the statement. Nevertheless, it will always have to be repeated and repeated identically without change in order to repro reproduce the truth effect without which there is no revolutionary politics. The institutionalization of power embodies conditions that constrain its ability to meet the statement of equal liberty, and the repeated abstract claims about always exceeds any concrete institutionalization. On the one hand, the statement leaves uh, the task of producing a politics of the right of men to practice, to struggle, to social conflict. On the other hand, the very act of institutionalization with respect to the governed community and the ruling power alike sets limits to both liberty and equality, and even with the best of intentions, it exerts a toll that gradually accumulates. But what about other kinds of politics? Focusing on the politics of the rights of men and the citizen, Etienne does not claim to exhaust the spectrum of possible kinds of politics, of course. About politics as such, he sometimes speaks in, in general terms uh, as, as a sphere of action, an institution dedicated to community building, etc. But the politics whose principle is equal liberty is of a special kind. Balibar argues, at least in the first essay, that the event of equal liberty became irre irreversible. It is irreversible not because the proposition has been universally accepted, but rather because it has set the terms of the political debate, such that even its opponents found themselves obliged to criticize it in its own language, based on its own term, uh, on its own impl implications. We have reason to doubt this claim of irreversibility today, but even if not, uh, we must acknowledge the possibility that some of the forces opposing equal liberty have promoted and relied on hyperbolic statements of their own. We, would, we should come to terms with such statements and their logic of power and community. We should not only think, uh, look at these other logic as encroachment on the claim of equality and liberty, but also understand the latter as a violation and of and threat to the former. My concept of the, of the political will emerge out of this attempt to confront the proposition of equal liberty with one of its others, one of its others. This point of entry is not logically uh, necessary, uh, but today, at least, I find it compelling. Consider this hyperbolic statement. Uh, presented here as a concise imperative. Your camp must be holy. The biblical verse <coughs> has been repeatedly proclaimed in numerous languages and various political contexts with considerable truth effects. The book of Deuteronomy is as, as old as Thales of Miletus, but I do not refer to it as an originary or founding moment. The verse merits attention due to the context in which the imperative of purity appears, a straightforward conjunction of hygiene and strategy, biopolitics and security. 
cleans your camp of the impure stuff your body discharges, the text says, so that God could reside in your midst and protect you from your enemies. Dig a hole, I'm just reading part, dig a hole with, it, uh, with uh, your trowel and then cover up your excitement. excitement. Uh, therefore, your camp must be holy. Purity is a means of survival uh, when living too close to God. Later, in the rabbinic tradition, purity came to be equated uh, with holiness and even replaced it altogether. The question what and who must be considered impure was then up for grabs. It is an open question which must be repeatedly posed because the nature of the impure cannot be known and nothing and nobody can be purified once and for all. Purity, I may say, is a, a generator of incompleteness. Living bodies, people on the move, with their numerous and unpredictable forms of intercourse, constantly produ produce impurity. The line needs to be redrawn constantly. This is the line drawn around the camp, designated the designating the community, uh, which must purify itself. Numerous repetitions and variations of the purity imperative can be found throughout history and across different cultures. Its enactment presupposes and reproduces a tension between the hyperbolic statement and its institutionalization, similar to the one Balibar describes with respect to equilibrium. With slight adaptation, this description may be paraphrased thus. There is a permanent tension between the condition and historically determined uh, that historically determined the construction of institutions that conform to the position that constitutes the purity of the community and the excessive hyperbolic purity which the statement seeks to establish, uh, etc. I will not read this all. Clearly, the proposition of equal, uh, equal liberty and the imperative of impurity differ in both form and content and involve very different regimes of truth. Most importantly, <coughs> is the, the extraordinary elenkos, or proof by double negation, which Balibar reconstructs with the respect to equality, and, uh, and which has no equivalence in the imperative of impurity. And yet, both claims for equal, equality and for purity exhibit a highly productive tension between the institutions of power and the statement that sets its principle and grants its le legitimacy. The history of citizenship, Balibar reminds us, is open. It did not start with modernity and its bourgeois and socialist revolutions, declarations of rights, etc., and it certainly also has a future after modernity. Is there a place in this history for the imperative of purity in its numerous versions? <coughs> I believe there is. If equal liberty has indeed become irreversible, the call for purity needs to be articulated with respect to the demarcation of a community of equals. But there was also, there was certainly a time in which the reverse was true, when the politics of equality was articulated in terms of a hegemonic regime of purity. Many examples may be given. I take mine, once again, from the Hebrew Bible. There we find the claim that the community of the pure must be a community of equals. This claim is raised by a rebel named Korach. You may remember his name and fate, which uh, Benjamin used as the paradigmatic case of divine violence. Korach's claim was addressed to Moses, uh, whose leadership he challenged. Again, I read just uh, the bolded li lines. Uh, so uh, Korach uh, uh, confronted uh, and company confronted Moses. Uh, you have gone too far. All the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. So why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? Korach was, a, was swallowed by the earth, and the opening of our politics of equality was lost with him, at least in the Hebrew Bible. The politics of purity, on the other hand, 
took several forms uh, in that corpus. Here is the most dramatic episode played out by Ezra, a leader of the Judeans who had returned to Jerusalem from their exile in Babylon. The people of Israel, the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands with their ab abominations. Uh, for they have taken some of their daughters and wives for themselves and the, for their sons. Th thus the holy seed has mixed itself with the people of the land. The story of the expulsion of the foreign wives in the book of Ezra has become a paradigm of segregationist supremacist politics and was used repeatedly from antiquity to our present, from Palestine to Nazi Germany and to the American Bible Belt. In Ezra, the call to purity seeks to limit the freedom to intermarry and the equality between indigenous residents and returning, returning newcomers. In light of this call uh, and its consequent institutionalization, whoever wishes to ease restrictions on the freedom to intermarry and question this inequality of status has to do so by rearticulating purity and interpreting or manipulating its internal logic. When commanded to expel their wives and children, the people of the Judean community dare not question either the imperative to purify or the impurity of their wives. The terms of the imperative were taken for granted. Their strategy of resistance, which was in fact their politics of purity, was based on a, a series of postponements. Uh, so the quote is from there. Instead of resisting the expulsion, they problematized its temporality. Thus, they reaffirmed the imperative while undermining its efficacy. That there is, that there has, and has always been a politics of purity is undeniable. Balibar would agree, I believe. It must also be acknowledged that some of the numerous re reiterations of the imperative had effects that seem, at least for a while, no less irreversible than those of the bourgeois revolutions of the 18th century. But it is precisely this kind of politics that is relegated out of the political by the kind of Greco-Eurocentrism expressed clearly and famously in the work of Jacques Rancière. The purity of the political is established at the expense of a politics of purity or any other form of non-egalitarian politics. Uh, I leave this quote, uh, you all know it. Uh, politics doesn't always happen. It all actually happens very rarely, etc., uh, etc. Et politics for us here is thus separated from most of human affairs. The numerous moments in which power was resisted without invoking that radical equality whose roots go back to Athens can no longer be considered part of the history of politics. How should one think about the politics of purity in such a context, about popular struggles of a party that proclaims and constitutes itself as a whole or not, just represent nothing but itself, uh, but uh, still uh, deny uh, parts of, to, to others, deny the parts of others in the holy. It would be a gross mistake to equate this party with what Rancière calls the police. Although the apparatuses of power were always involved, the people themselves took great part in reiterating and enforcing the imperative of purity criticizing the authorities and defy, defying sovereign powers in its name. There is no reason to exclude from the history of politics and the theory of the political the many forms this politics took throughout history, including almost any version of sectarian politics, whose ultimate principle ever since the Judean Parisians was purity. In La Maison Tente, Rancière refuses to give the politics of purity its due share in the political. But if the imperative of purity is understood as a political proposition, and a politics of purity is, is one, simply understood as one form of politics among others, radical democracy cannot provide the perspective from which a concept of the political 
can be thought and articulated. Such a concept must account for radical democracy and the politics of pur purity as two very different political formations and ways to perform the political, two among many others. The propositions of equal liberty, which is an interpretation of radical democracy, of course, allows us to do so if, only, if we only drop the claim about its irreversibility. Let me start with a quick comparison. <coughs> equal liberty is a proposition of a ceaseless process of democratization. As such, it is incompatible with any political regime, except for a democracy that constantly deconstruct and re reconstruct itself. The imperative of purity, on the other hand, does not exclude any regime found on Plato's or Aristotle's or Montesquieu's or Arendt's list of political regimes. It rather inflects each of these in a very specific way. In this sense, the imperative of purity inflects citizenship too and must be considered part of its history. Purity presents a principle that precedes the division between community and ruling power, demos and arche, and which gives these distinctions their distinct form. At one and the same time, purity defines, or at least sets limits to, and conditions, both the political community and the authority that rules over it. For equal liberty, the closure of the community and the hierarchy of power are both inevitable and obstacles to be negated and overcome. For the politics of purity, these are rigorously fixed and stabilized according to the way purity is understood. E equal liberty is, as you all know, horizontal. It is a principle of relation between anyone and everyone. Purity is vertical. It is a principle of relation to a transcendent element, whether a god or an idea, be it race, nation, revolution, or any other. The imperative to purify doesn't simply contradict the universal claim of equality and liberty, because it is always addressed to a particular, a dis a distinct, if not chosen, camp, which it presupposes <coughs> and constitutes at the same time. Purity endows the political community with an absolute privilege that preempts universality to the court. This is how the imperative Took, for, took part in the history of politics in general and in the history of citizenship in particular. In much of modern and con contemporary politics, certainly here today, the purity of the camp and the universal equal liberty are not simply contradictory but antagonistic positions. This antagonism, and not any essentialist Straussian opposition between Athens and Jerusalem, is the reason for thinking the two together today. The concept of the political, which I would like to sketch now, does not result from a dialectical process that may take place between purity and equal liberty. It is rather based on a reflection on the common ground of these two forms of politics. The common ground, I believe, is precisely that permanent tension between the institutions of power and the hyperbolic statement which sets the principle these institutions are supposed to embody. The political emerges through this tension, while the performance, the enacted statement, and the institutions simultaneously assume their politicality. Only when directed at a certain existing, existing order of power does the performance of the statement assume or reveal its political nature. And only when addressed by a claim that problematizes their logic or practice do institutions of power lose their self-evident nature, assume their politicality, and reveal themselves as pot potential stakes in politics. Most of Bolivar's works is situated in the space opened here, interpolated by this tension between the hyperbolic statement and the uh, political institution. He would never fix his thinking on uh, either of those poles without immediately referring to the other, working to reconstruct the dialectics that unfolds between them. He does not name this tension, nor does he conceive it as a concept in its own right. Uh, he's here to do it if he wants. <laughs> 
Uh, for my part, I'm taking the liberty of naming the tension and treating it as a manifestation of a basic, basic structure which, with certain qualification, is both a necessary and sufficient condition for the appearance of anything political. This tension and this gap between the institutions of a ruling power and the acts that actually or virtually, but always publicly, a point, a point uh, to which I will return, uh, so actually and virtually challenge them, uh, uh, challenge power, uh, is precisely where the political resides, in this tension, in this space. The camp and its proclaimed purity, just like equal, e equality, liberty, and their universality, may be at stake in such a challenge. But none of these configurations is necessary for the appearance of the political as such, not even their own appearance as political. All it takes uh, uh, <clears throat> for this to happen is a public problematization of an existing power, order of power, that invokes at least one principle which the ruling power and the, or the people who defy it claim to be binding. Therefore, a struggle in which nothing is, is at stake except for the sheer will to dominate, on the one hand, or whimsical expression of individual freedom, on the other hand, such a struggle cannot be considered political. Political is any event in which a ruling po power is problematized in public in the name of a binding principle. This may take place even when a ruling power publicly defends one of its own acts or principles without being directly challenged. For such a defense means that the possibility of, uh, of a challenge is publicly acknowledged. That is, that an order of power has been denaturalized. An act, a person, a monument, policies, procedures, pattern of exchange and interrelation, space and time, gods and animals, any of these may become political by taking part in a political event, being drawn into the space open in public between the challenging or problematizing act and the problematized institution. A thing becomes political because it becomes integral to such a challenge or its suppression. The political event, and, and please don't think about events in Badiou's term, uh, just a commonsensical sense of event I have in mind here. Any demonstration, any, any accident in the street is an event. The political event is ephemeral, as Arendt explained with respect to her idiosyncratic concept of power. But such uh, much more frequent than she allowed. The conditions that make political events possible are more stable, but less ephemeral. But when they cease to exist and the space of public contention disappears, the political cannot come into being. Arendt explained this in detail, taking totalitarianism as a paradigmatic, albeit not the only case, in which the space that enables the uh, uh, political events is eliminated. Others have extended this analysis to neoliberalism. The political cannot take place without the actual, uh, or at least virtual, anticipated co-presence of demos and arche. It is distributed between these two poles, granting politicality to each, although never emanating from either of them. It is rather always in between. The universality of equilibrity and the exclusivity of the pure camp are two very different forms of this in-between, uh, uh, which this in-between might take. At certain historical moments, one of these forms may appear as the exact inversion of the other. And when the two cohabit a world, they certainly fight each other for domination. But all too often, while struggling, they, thus, they also problematize and defy the very same power. Now, all this may sound trivial, but I think it is nevertheless consequential. The political is not an idealized realm or a set of transcendental principles that precedes or conditions politics, grounds its autonomy, or sets its ultimate goals. The political is an event that takes place by publicly problematizing a certain order of power with respect to principles that should allegedly bind it, and in the very space created by this problematization. <clears throat> 
The political event is nothing but the public performance of this problematization. Its nature and scope determines what is being politicized. Nothing is politicized avant la lettre, before being displayed, prior to the performance and outside the scope of some such performance. And nothing remains political without certain reiteration of this performance, or at least without the ghostly presence of its suspended rate repetitions. This means, among other things, that the question of the autonomy of the political, which concerned Balibar a great deal, must be recast. The political event is one in which a certain portion of politics, other seen, is put on display, a certain portion. That another scene always accompanies politics, both preceding and following it. That the political struggle is both displayed from other spheres of action and continues through other means, and that forces working in those other scenes prepare the ground for uh, the performance and shape the stage uh, of the performance, all this is taken for granted here. Because the rules that are supposed to guarantee autonomy might themselves be challenged, autonomy is reduced to the indeterminacy of freedom. None of the forces and structures at work behind the political scene can determine the political event. How and what would be problematized, resisted, defied, can never be, be foreclosed. And of course, none of the consequences of this problematization, no matter how totalitarian an order of power might become. The problematization of power, however, need not be performed as defiance, disobedience, or anarchy. These are invoked at the very moment uh, in which power is denaturalized. <coughs> only one, one only has to look through the open cracks to see the abyss, as Balibar following Arendt shows convincingly. On the other hand, when power is performed, performed by those ascribed with agency and authority, the policeman, the tax collector, the street light, the speaking head on the TV screen, each of these may invoke the imaginary perpetuity and ubiquity of the ruling power and the supremacy of its authority. Both kinds of performance, by surrogates of a ruling power and by those challenging it, and act and imply suspensions of violent acts. But it is not violence itself that is suspended, only more violence, surplus violence. At the end of the slippery slope of violence stands the violence that would eliminate the space in which the political resides. This violence cannot be monopolized, not even by the, an effective sovereign power, and it might come from both sides of the barricades, no matter how asymmetrical the power relations seems to be. Two final comments. First about politics. I kept shifting between politics and the political, but the distinction should be made. Politics is a particular form of performing the political and of concealing it at the same time. On the one hand, not every political act is part of a distinct politics. A public reading of a poem, graffiti on the wall, uh, a defiant speech in a graduation ceremony, all may be political while lacking affiliation with any recognizable political organization. On the other hand, not all politics is political. Whatever goes on behind closed doors and concealed from the public, power struggles, manipulations, conspiracy, become political only once it is publicly exposed. The same is true more generally for institutions of power and of authority. Gewalt and Herrschaft, state apparatuses and terrorist organizations are not politically simply by virtue of being an exercise of authority or brute force for collective ends, not even because, any concern, because they concern the lives of the governed <coughs> and the boundaries of, and composition of the community. They become political when split by the acts that call them into question in public, uh, call into question what they do, how they are structured, how they are affected by forces beyond their control. Here too, much remains unsaid, unthematized, and ignored. There is always more ruling and governing than the political event can bring to light and question. 
when demanding not to be governed thus, that much, or like this, those defying power are living in the dark, unarticulated, not politicized, everything that lies in between what has been problematized and total anarchy. Finally, a word about the public. It has its own institution too, of course, but these may well be called into question by a political event. With the help of figures like camp, community, the people, the nation, the working class, etc., the public, or what it stands for, is imagined more clearly than it can ever be grasped or experienced. None of these figures, however, is a necessary condition for the political event. Lately, the public is simulated by opinion polls and replaced by devices like people meters. Neither an imagined nor simulated public can stand for the public which a political event requires. This public appears when some people, and it doesn't matter how many or who they are, some people are capable of responding to power by saying, not we the people, but whether we, those people, governed by this power. And actually, ruling power is the first thing a political community has in common. And this is, it is from this common uh, that a new discussion of the political might begin. So we have about 30 minutes um, time for discussion. And I see Jay has his hand up first and followed by Bonnie. So, so, of course, thank you very much. In a way, I'm not, in a way, this is more uh, a question for clarification, because I'm not sure I follow the argument. Um, uh, I take it you were suggesting that the notion of the political uh, have that, what I think of as a Rend or Ronciarian or Wolin-like character of that moment of contestation of power. Um, and, and it's certainly right to say that that's not the same as the notion of the political that's in Balibar when he's claiming that the political as the condition of intelligibility of the modernity as such is the horizon under which we can ask the question of who we are, and no other sphere is, as it were, uh, possible that is under this horizon. Now, I take it the thesis of irreversibility means that, that there are no metaphysical questions, there are no religious questions, that the thought of modernity is the thought that purity simply can only arise in the space of the political, um, and it can't arise in its own name. So, so first, I'm not sure why you're so insistent on getting rid of that notion of the political, um, which seems to me to be asking a question more like, what is the horizon under which we think who we are, and, and in what sense you think, I mean, if there is any concept that doesn't belong to modernity, it's, it's purity. Um, and, and that's, and, and I don't, didn't really understand why you were su su suggesting that because people want to claim purity, that they belong within the same space. Um, so I really, this is really just clarification. I didn't see the logic here. I just saw two paradigms. Uh, so at the time I thought that, uh, that uh, uh, Balibar uh, is with Rancière. Uh, no. <laughs> 
At time, I thought he can be, he can be uh, uh, pushed or, or taken to my, uh, my way of, 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 of thinking about it. I read irrever uh, irre irreversibility in this particular context, not, not uh, the irrevers irreversibility of modernity, but irreversibility of the event of equilibrity as referring to the way that equilibrity became the, uh, say the paradigm of the debate, as, as the, the first quote that, that I uh, have there says more or less uh, uh, clearly, uh, that, that, that uh, uh, it, it, it is resisted in the terms, uh, or, or it is fought against in, in, in the terms that it set. And, and, and against this, I, I wanted to uh, offer a, a different paradigm of uh, of struggle, which is political, uh, and this sense, and, and, and which is of course not modern, uh, because uh, it, this may be uh, a bit uh, you know, megalomaniac, but I think uh, when I when I would like when I produce when I present a concept, I would like it to be as wide in scope as possible, uh, uh, and and. Uh, I think that if we read uh, the contentions around purity, uh, and, and of course there are many reasons to bring purity in, but, but, but let's say just as an example. If we read these contentions around purity and do not understand them as political, in the strongest sense of being political, we miss something really important. Okay, so, so uh, my, my uh, Move was was to, to think equilibrity and purity, uh, and look for, for, for this what I call the, this common ground and, and find it in, in the in the contention. Now this is not exactly runs here. It is not exactly Aaron because uh, I want something which is much more quotidian uh, and 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 which is, depends on the simply on the performativity of of problematization uh, and has the same. Uh, aspect of, of the ephemerality of the performance uh, the, 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 is not carrying is not carried forward just on its own by itself just because once it was political then it is, it is always uh, political so th this is it, it's, a, it's a very different temporality uh, uh, to, to, to the political. so Adi I I uh, I I have not read Ezra lately, <laughs> but but uh, clearly we all should, and um, and you said something about it's the, it, the quote number ten on your sheet. You you were a little bit uh, dismissive of this moment in the story, where it says, "But the people are many, and it's a time of he heavy no. rain." You're not dismissive? dismissive? No. You like this? Yes, very much. Okay, so I, <laughs> good. Okay, so, uh, so I thought you said that this is a failure to stand up politically to make clear the political opposition. No, what I said is that uh, this is a moment in which the terms of purity are accepted, taken for granted, and yet within this framework there is resistance. Okay, so I want to say more. Okay, undermining of, of the... Okay, that's better than what I thought you said, so uh, good. Um, no, no, I think that's interesting. So, but I would just push even further a little bit on this point. So I thought you had said uh, that it's not political because, it, you know, they're not, uh, the antagonism is not uh, strong. Um, but I'm not sure, I think what I was responding to then also was the idea that the terms of purity are accepted. So in this uh, f line, which is a really funny line, I mean, it's you know we can't we you know we we know we have to expel all the foreigners, but we can't right now because it's raining. I mean, it's it's funny. <laughs> so right. So um, now I would say I would say first of all that it's funny already is means it's impure and not pure. Um, that uh, and I would suggest to you maybe um, that it punctures the temporality of impurity because the temporality of impurity in the context of the framework of purity which you say is not contested the temporality of impurity is now like we're not waiting there's an impurity you have to get rid of it right away so 
sort of in introducing this other temporality at which, you know, maybe later would be better. Right now we're kind of busy, it's raining, you know, we'll take our time. The stalling technique is itself a subtle contestation of purity. I just want to, I just want to press a little bit, you know, because I, I see that we're mostly in agreement. Um, and I even want to say that it's a really valuable instance right now of, for us of one technique of sanctuary, which doesn't accept the frame, but chooses not to resist the frame in order to resist the frame. <coughs> And so I, this is, yeah, this is this the is, little uh, point I want to suggest. Uh, this is precisely what I said. It's, I said, instead of resisting the expulsion, they problematize its temporality. But I think this is and, resisting and the expulsion. Like, this is yeah, why yeah, we differ course. a little yeah, bit, because I, I think it yeah, is yeah. resisting so this, the expulsion. This is, uh, this is what I meant. I okay, mean, oh, good. So okay. this is, uh, I think so there is a... So then our but, only but difference... there is a political... <laughs> What's that? Right, no, I, I, well, you can hope, you know, I mean, so, and, and it also depends, by the way, that's a, a related, but that's a related point, exactly, because it depends on how you read rain. If you, I mean, there could be the intimation that this rain is a divine sign, which is a counter-narrative uh, already implied in this, well, in this it's, objection. It's even, it's even better, because Good. after, after, <laughs> after the, uh, this incident, we have a, a long list of all the families who were supposed to expel, Produce, uh, yeah. uh, to expel their wives and yeah. children. Yeah. But there is no line in the text that says that expulsion took place. <laughs> took place. It could be deferred, yeah. 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 So I think Gary, yeah, just very quickly, um, and this may be as much for a ten. Um, <laughs> well, we you're can share. <coughs> sorry, we can you're share. implicated in the question. One is just quickly. I wonder how much we concede at the outset by qualifying the principle. Universalism, for example, here with excessive and hyperbolic. Why not the impoverished institution and the real universality or something like that? So I'm just wondering what we think about that peculiar asymmetry, whether that already says something about what we think about politics. And then the other question very quickly is about those instances when the gap between institution and principle, which generates the process of demanding that, of making that hyperbolic demand, whether when that mechanism itself reproduces relations of domination or exi an existing order, which happens quite a lot, where the principle <coughs> itself isn't called into question, but, and, and, and it works to normalize the principle even as it generates what seems to be a politics. I, I, I don't, I'm not sure. I, Completely so, for example, it. back to the I, rights question earlier. I, I think that what you said is, is, is correct. I mean, some answers, yes, okay. for both, both things. I was just thinking about that along with you because it seemed to be that the crucial um, definition of, of, of the political at the end was that, that ever incomplete gap. That was the, you know, this endless process of democratizing which I completely agree with in all kinds of domains. And in other domains, I can see that as a kind of endless deferral or diversion from a certain kind of transformative project. It's not necessarily one or the other, but you didn't, I'm just putting that on the table as another aspect of that gap that we might want to be mindful of. Yeah. Right. I, I just want to say that, 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 that the generation of incompleteness is not necessarily democratization. It can go both ways. Okay. Um, maybe I'll, I'll continue on the uh, topic of the gap. Um, but first, I wanted to ask Emily a question, which is um, whether there were antagonisms among uh, some of the positions that you sought to put together in your paper that you had to suppress in order to um, have them cohabit as peacefully as they did. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and how that might uh, relate to the task of the translator. Okay. Um, the, the, you, you have time to think about that answer. Um, Adi, um, so this is, this is um, a question I have about the two uses. Um, you know, you, you talk 
uh, you, you call the paper the political, and when you cite Vali Bar on politics as a sphere or realm of action and institutions dedicated to community building, regulating social conflict, and the rest, it's called politics. But I take it that at least that use of the word politics is more or less interchangeable with the political in your title. Um, and then, of course, when you cite Rancière, um, we have politics again. But in that second instance, it doesn't pertain to the sphere or realm of action and institutions dedicated to community building, regulating social conflict, and the rest. It's a, it's a punctual moment, or even an event, ordinary or not, or a performance, okay? At which point it happens rarely, and it's a kind of happening, rather than a sphere or a, a realm in which such events happen. So that's, that struck me as a kind of a tension, and one of the reasons um, I think it might be important is that if we take seriously the hyperbolic universal universality claim, and I mean, I do this all the time, right? One says, you know, all lives are grievable, and people say, but they're not. And it's like, well, I know. <laughs> you know, I live in the world, but I'm holding out for, I'm, I'm making this crazy, impossible, hyperbolic claim, and because the world should be that way, and precisely because it is not that way, someone has to be the fool, just be, you know, and I am the, I'm the fool, right? Okay, so I wanna hold on to hyperbolic as important and even as like, like, like impossible, right? Even in a Derridian sense, perhaps, impossible and, and necessary. Um, uh, I understand that, but the claim itself, and we still never answered Susan's excellent question about what is a claim or how a claim takes place, and that might be a performance, it might be a movement, I, it, it's not necessarily a verbal action, maybe it is a verbal action, but we don't really know what claiming a right is or what, what different kinds of forms that take. It might even be a, a silent movement of a certain <coughs> way. Um, but in any case, um, that, that claim uh, or this event that happens rarely, um, it's, it strikes me that it's not exactly the same issue if, at least in the Rancière that you're choosing here, um, it's about stopping the tracks of the, stopping the apparatus of power in its tracks, and so a moment of deinstitutionalization, right? Actually closer to a gamben, right? Closer to an, almost an anarchistic deinstitutionalization, right? Taking it down, stopping it in its tracks. Now, if that, that strikes me as a, as a different kind of moment um, than the hyperbolic claim, which could also be punctual or, an, or participate in an event structure such as the one that you describe, but one that is actually working to uh, produce a governing principle or a set of ideals for institutions that include community building, regulating social conflict, defending public interest, taking and exercising power, governing the multitude, transforming social relations, or even equilibri equilibrity, <coughs> even equilibrity. Um, so, um, so I just, I just think uh, that it makes a, a difference whether we see that moment as a moment of institution building, like the reproduction of the ideal within a set of institutions to expand them, to embrace equality and liberty in, in important ways, uh, substantializing or actualizing those ideals, or whether we understand them as, um, uh, as, as, the, as a moment of radical deinstitutionalization, or perhaps both in a different terrain, but it did make me think that the, that the sphere of the political would have to be expanded or, or made more precise to a, account for that kind of tension. Sorry, I went on too long. I mean, I think that it, this is a, you raise something that occurs frequently in, when you're the, the trans, Atlantic or cross-channel third-term reading French theory. Um, and I've actually made that critique many times to students who seem to put different theorists into colloquy who have 
important disagreements and those disagreements slip away. But I think that you can flip that around and say that, especially in the French tradition, a lot of the, you know, the sort of grand tête, they, they, they tend to write in isolation in a kind of freestanding mode, resonating off each other, but not necessarily taking on each other's arguments. I think Etienne is unusually generous and in, much more the interlocutor than most, but when you think of, you know, sort of Lacan, Derrida, Barthes, uh, all in one very small space and running into each other, and the, it's Badiou. actually astonishing, Badiou, Badiou, Badiou yeah. how few times they actually address each other. Um, you almost feel that it is up to the task of the translator or the uh, the intermediary or the transdisciplinarian <laughs> to sort of take that risk and say, how do these discourses actually speak to each other? Uh, maybe our ears are more tuned to it because we're um, hearing some of the, the sort of uh, places where, they, where the concepts are clearly ca ca taking, being germinated in a form of intellectual sociality where they are in dialectical relation to each other. And so I think one of the things I was trying to do was to, to really take on this question of, you know, is it Rancière is the count and Etienne is the antinomy, antinomy uh, rethinking of the citizen subject. And it, these things tend to be sort of placed oddly in these little islands that each generate a different path. And, and it's not that they haven't been in plenty of, of events together and, and, and engaged in um, dialogues, but it, it seems to me that there's a kind of question of a, of a, of a sort of mathematical nature um, in, in, a, in and around how equality is being defined that um, coming at it from these different points, but that there are these convergences. So it's not to paper over historic disagreements among them so much as to draw out um, certain ways of thinking these concepts that are between something in some ways very much embedded in a kind of material moment politically and also, or in, to do with rereading you know, every Plato or, or Marx or, but that there's something else that's also going on, which is this, you can distill maybe other common points of conceptualizing um, that are important for rethinking uh, questions like proportionate equality, uh, which if you sort of stuck just to one, wouldn't necessarily emerge. And, you know, Badiou was in town on Tuesday, so I listened to him speaking about number. And it was, it was, a, it was a curious, uh, it, in, in my mind it was compartmentalized, right? It, ha it would have nothing to do with the paper on equal liberty. But in fact, the more I started to think about it, it, it had an, there was a very much a colloquy to take place. I don't know if I succeeded in communicating it. It's all sort of fresh off the back of the truck, but it's, it's, it's something that goes, that's going on there, I think, around the question of number, around the question of infinity, around the question of proportionate equality. And these are slightly different kinds of problems than if, if we stick to some, to one person's canon. Mm -hmm. um, I have three quick comments. Uh, one, about uh, pol the political being a rare event, uh, I, I don't think it's a rare event. Not definitely not rare in the sense that Francia means, means it. Uh, well, it's not, maybe it doesn't happen to everyone every day, but it happens every day in some part of, this, of, of town. Uh, and, and Providence is, is a big enough town for this, that it happens at one, once a day somewhere. Uh, and and uh, And, and the one, most important thing that happens there is not that power, uh, uh, that there is a transformation of power, that power collapse, or, or, or there, there is something dramatic of this, of this kind. The most important thing that happens is that you experience power as something which is not uh, <coughs> natural and necessary. You experience the possibility of the otherwise. 
This is the moment of the problematization that I, that I uh, emphasized. Uh, and from there, many things can happen, and nothing is, can be uh, uh, predictable. Now, politics for me uh, is, is, is the, 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 the specific form in which uh, the political is, is put into display. Uh, politics, so there must be politics one and politics two. So politics two is the, the usual, the sphere. And about the sphere, I said, well, there are many uh, um, things that happen, uh, institution, people, and actions, especially uh, in politics as such, that are not political because they do not include this moment of, uh, of opening uh, of, of, of the, the otherwise uh, of, a, of, a order, of an order of power. Uh, and uh, just uh, more, one more remark. Uh, uh, I taught a class on Balibar this semester. Uh, and, and we had, uh, the, the, the organization was uh, um, conceptual. That is, we, we talk about ideology, about equality, about civility. I looked uh, uh, quite hard for uh, one text or, or a few texts that could do the same work uh, for the concept of, of politics or the political. And I failed. Uh, I couldn't find any. So I started to, 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 to uh, reconstruct. Uh, and, and, uh, and then came the election. And I started, I, I spoke about, yeah. And, and I spoke about you. Since we're really now running late, let's take two, the two next questions together and take the status and at Bruce. Uh, it's a democracy. Yes, okay, very quickly. Uh, Emily, in light of your um, argument about equivalence and translatability, I would just like to hear what you would think of uh, Ranciere's a notion of radical substitutability of democratic action, um, which is not, um, um, does not abolish uh, the inequalities that remain, uh, that may remain, or let's say the mark of social difference that may remain, um, you know, whether one is a man or woman or a lawyer and a farmer or whatever it is, the, you know, rich or poor. Uh, the, there's a certain radical equivalence that cannot, is not maneuverable in democratic action regardless of inequality. So, so I'd like to hear your thoughts about that. Uh, uh, which, and Adi, I mean, this, this is sort of connected because from a certain standpoint one might say Ranciere's formulation is kind of purist. It's formal in that sense. Uh, but so I understand the, the, and I agree with the, the need that to take uh, the politics of purity seriously as politics, that there's a certain kind of intervention in the political but I may not have understood your argument very well. I don't quite um, see how that um, manages to overcome what seems to be, to me, a, an, again, a kind of outmaneuverable impurity in things political, no matter what. Even if, in fact, um, the political might, to go back to Gary's our, uh, uh, concern, might be, insofar as it's open-ended and sort of self-undoing and so on and so forth, might lead to an endless de deferral. And against that, we need to have a politics of decision. And I'm all in favor of politics of decision. Even when, a, when decision might interrupt that sort of thing, and they may be considered to be a purest moment, it does not abolish the, what seems to me to be a, a kind of I don't know, it's sort of outmaneuverable out impurity. That's the thing about the political that is profound. It, you cannot get around the impurity of the political, no matter what. And I'm, not, I'm not talking about systems, political systems, you know, ancient, modern history, you know, none outside the historical realm. It seems to me that the political realm is characterized by a kind of, I don't know what, how else to say it, by an impurity, a kind of basic mixing of categories because of its endless sort of conflictual character that cannot be gotten around, even when decision might interrupt it and cut it, which I, I, I think is necessary, I'm, I'm, you know, in order to avoid the endless deferral. In the interest of time, 
This will be a yes or no question. <laughs> no. <laughs> See, you prioritize negation. Do you have a denunciation in your pocket, which you decided not to display, of political claims made in the name of hybridity? Oh. Hybridity. Political name? name? Claims. 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 In other words, when you talk about a politics of purity, and the word hybridity is all over the place, and a certain number of political claims are made in the name of, let's say, diasporic hybridity, people who have multiple and conflicting claims to different uh, nations, right? I thought maybe, I, yes or no question? <laughs> This cannot be a one, one word answer because I think you presuppose something that uh, you, you ascribe to me something that I, I do not take. And, and this is in order to den denounce, I have to be a purist of a sort. And it, the politics of purity is not mine. I mean, it's there. I spoke about something, it's there. So, no, no denunciation that's of enough. purity. That's no, enough. no. That's good. So, okay, can I? Uh, <laughs> um, the study is about impurity. I, I'm, I'm not sure I understood the, the question, but uh, uh, maybe uh, the, the, to, to say that politics is, 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 is uh, um, you know, um, pervaded with impurity is like say, saying that uh, with, with respect to the imperative of purity, is like saying that politics is pervaded with inequality with respect to the proposition of equality. Uh, it's just the same. Of course it is perverted with, with, uh, with uh, 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 impurity. Uh, the proposition is abstract and, you know, uh, kind of... Uh, I think, I think it's what liberty is the epitome of an impure position. But anyway... Uh, so, the, the proposition of, of pure... The, the imperative or proposition of, of purity refers to the a community that is, uh, and to politics and to power that is uh, uh, imminently impure and, and, and gives it a task. You have to purify. Purification is, is a constant uh, effort, constant labor, never ending labor of purification. I'm sorry, just to understand, in the, in, in the, in the, from the side of those who are against equal liberty or from just any side? Those who, those, who, who, those who utter the imperative of purity, those who say purify your camp, your camp should be holy, address a camp that is always, always, always in a process of impurification and hence has to be always purified. But I think you're speaking past each other, if I may. Yeah, I, I, so I, I don't... Because I think you're, you're identifying impurity with inequality, for instance. Which he's not doing. No, no, I'm not. I'm You're just, not. I'm, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> because I took the the meaning of the the Quran that you use to be an em, an embrace of impurity. I, I I took this this. I mean, you're against those who want to purify, who, who are against misogynation, right? Of course. Okay. So, but 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 it sounds like you are also arguing in favor of purity. I'm not in favor of purity. I'm trying to say that purity is, is a kind of politics that has to be understood and has to be taken into account in any account of the political. Okay. And, and, and I say this against a common trend uh, to, to think about politics and the political from the point of view of, of democracy, uh, even not necessarily liberal democracy, but democracy, uh, and, and, and take for granted that these are the, this is the framework for thinking about the political. This was my point. It was not addressing, uh, 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 it, it wasn't supporting any kind of impurity politics or purity politics. It's a logic that you're trying yeah. to explain. You were systematically misunderstood. <laughs> yes, I think so. I think people misunderstood you. <laughs> like four questions. I dropped my uh, intention to to say, to say something, but 
is like, uh, this is the way presidents uh, <laughs> talk, and it's much better because you can see, okay. So, uh, by the way, the mics are, are terrible, or my ears are terrible with this. Um, Adi, um, I thought, I believe to understand, but I, I couldn't hear everything you said, I have to admit. Um, uh, I believe to understand that at some point, um, you had explained that um, um, the proposition of equal liberty on one side, and uh, what is it? Is it a proposition or is it a, a principle? Uh? Imperative. Imperative, yes, of purity <coughs> would uh, um, embody, or yes, um, two in fact, radically antithetic concepts of the political. Is that, uh, I'm beginning with something very simple. Is that true? Two antithetic or antagonistic, two antagonistic politics. Politics, yeah. politics, but not concepts of the political. No. Uh-huh, okay. The whole point was to say the concept of the political cannot be derived from any of these Form okay, uh, may, maybe That's in that case, I, I'll, I'll stop there, but maybe I'm mixing something that I heard from Emily, which I have to say I liked enormously, or, or that gave me a lot to think, and something I was uh, hearing in you. What I heard in uh, uh, Emily's attempt at um, transferring and translating the question of equality from uh, what seems to be its originary uh, uh, domain, uh, that is the political, but in a certain relatively narrow uh, uh, sense. And in fact, uh, uh, like it or not, even through the uh, uh, antithesis of insurrection and constitution linked to the question of the state and, and, uh, and, and the law. Uh, so in transferring or translating that into the uh, ultimately, of course, not separated, but at least apparently very different uh, domain and field of translation and inequalities in the realm of translation. She was actually uh, performing the uh, a gesture, sorry for dropping that uh, infamous name, very similar to the one that makes it possible for Schmidt to define his concept of the political. Because what Schmidt writes at the beginning of uh, uh, the concept of the political is the definition of the political in terms of the uh, friend uh, uh, versus uh, uh, enemy uh, um, uh, antagonism or uh, uh, a distinction, rather. Um, uh, it's important to, 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 to say this does not only concern the realm of the political in the narrow sense, the state, in the state, it can be applied in many other different domains, theology, aesthetic, uh, and so on and so on. After which, of course, he, <laughs> he comes back to the question of the state, and uh, we can understand that it was just a, a, a way, etc. So I, 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 listening to, to, to Emily, I said, okay, what she's now showing is uh, the principle or proposition or theorem of equal liberty has some, if not all, of the formal qualities of a concept of the political in a some, somewhat Schmittian sense, even if it's not the same, of course, which directly leads to the question, uh, uh, to asking the question about how many such concepts of the political do we do uh, 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 know, or we can, in fact, uh, discuss and analyze. And in fact, there are several. I mean, it's uh, so. So at some point, I wrongly believed that you were <laughs> following the same uh, uh, track and uh, 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 counterposing uh, or confronting. Uh, uh, equal liberty and purity in terms of two different concepts of the political. But the, the, the main point was perhaps not that, it was the fact that uh, um, uh, when you introduce the other scene, I mean, I believe to understand that uh, if two such principles or two such uh, 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 orientations uh, or politics, if you, if you, if you like, actually uh, uh, meet or, or, or clash, uh, in the same uh, 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 moment uh, uh, or the same place, 
uh, or the same world, uh, uh, because precisely of their hyperbolic uh, 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 character, uh, what you get is not only uh, uh, um, a choice that leaves no uh, uh, line of uh, escape or kind of radical confrontation, but it's extreme violence. Okay. It's extreme uh, 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 violence. In other terms, uh, to use uh, my formula, which I borrowed from, from where you know, uh, 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 we, 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 we move to the other scene move to the other scene. Whereas we were, uh, in fact, uh, uh, at the beginning, uh, I wouldn't say uh, on the scene of uh, uh, rationality, but the scene of the confrontation between discourses and, 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 and principles. And something, uh, such things uh, uh, happen, of course, uh, in, in, in history, they are extremely disturbing. The moments when you uh, uh, said to yourself, perhaps after a, a, a presidential election, wow, we are on a different scene. We are, we are on now on a different, scene. we're on a different uh, uh, scene. So maybe this is a stupid uh, uh, association of my No, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> Just thank you.